Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you uh, for coming tonight to our heroin awareness presentation. Uh, one of the best things that we can do as a community is to ensure prevention of uh, drug abuse. And in DuPage County, uh, especially for the last year or two, two years, we have been seeing a, a real large uh, spike in the number of heroin overdoses uh, that have been occurring throughout the county. Uh, in Glendale Heights, uh, we have had, uh, essentially, we've stayed pretty level on that. Uh, we've had about one a year uh, heroin overdose deaths. Uh, and also, uh, last year, we had two saves uh, for uh, someone who had overdosed, and uh, we were able to uh, save uh, with uh, help from the police department and also the uh, fire department getting to the scene soon enough. Uh, but tonight, uh, we are presenting a community awareness presentation, uh, and we have a great deal of uh, expertise uh, on our panel tonight. Um, I just want to introduce to you uh, State's Attorney Bob Berlin, DuPage County Coroner Dr. Jorgensen, the uh, Chief of the uh, DuPage Metropolitan Enforcement Group, Mark Pickley. Just wave or something so they know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> to my left, um, we have Adventist Glen Oaks Emergency Room Manager, uh, Jill Pateros. We have the co-founder of LTM Heroin Awareness uh, Foundation, Angelica Salvaggio. I got it. Nice. <laughs> uh, we have a recovered uh, addict, uh, Nick Gore, uh, celebrating two years right. tomorrow. <laughs> 12 more hours. You got it. We're going to get you there. And. Um, the mother of the victim of a heroin overdose, uh, Felicia Maselli, who will share her story with us tonight as well. Uh, you did not come here to hear me speak tonight, uh, but I do want to thank you for being here, and I would like to introduce uh, Mr. Bob Berlin uh, to start the program. Oh, I knew I'd forget this. Uh, there are cards and pens around. If you have questions, uh, we'll certainly be taking questions at the end, and you can certainly Raise your hand, ask questions. If you prefer, you can write your question on the card. We have a basket at the back of the room, and we can pass that around at some point during the night um, in order to have the opportunity to anonymously ask a question. I'll pull them out of there and ask them. We call that our D.A.R.E. box. Uh, when we do our D.A.R.E. program, that's the D.A.R.E. box, and kids are able to put a question in there and uh, anonymously ask the question, and we're able to, uh, to answer that at the end of the program. So we'll do that here tonight. Our D.A.R.E. box is at the back, and we will pass that around. Thank you. Thank you, Chief, and good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming out on this cold evening uh, to hear about such an important issue that our county is facing, uh, and really not just DuPage County, but all of the collar counties uh, in the area here. Uh, to give you some idea of what we're dealing with with heroin, uh, in 2011, the county experienced 27 overdose deaths there were 42 in 2012 and 46 last year in 2013, and the victims ranging in ages from 15 all the way up to 64. When I uh, came to uh, DuPage County as a prosecutor back at the end of 2004, there were no more than three or four heroin possession cases. As of uh, two months ago, we had 84, more than any other uh, drug, 41% uh, of our felony possession cases are now heroin. Uh, and that just gives you some indication of how prevalent this drug is uh, out in our community. And there's a number of reasons for it. Uh, it's, it's supply and demand. Uh, two tenths of a gram of heroin is $10. And somebody can go and, and get what they call a jab which is 12 or 13 of these little packets for about $120. Um, and ten, $10 is enough for someone uh, to get them high. Uh, and obviously, as people use more and more and become addicted to it, uh, they use more of it. And unfortunately, what we see is the habit gets very expensive 
And that's when people start breaking into cars, homes, businesses, and stealing to support their habit. Uh, what we're trying to do is prevent that from happening uh, because what we found is more so than any other drug, heroin is extremely addictive. Uh, and it's a very difficult habit to break. We've had a lot of success uh, with treatment when it comes to cocaine and other drugs. Heroin is very difficult, and as you're going to learn tonight, uh, Nick's going to tell you about his road. It is a long road to recovery. Uh, but one of the reasons it's so addictive is the purity has increased. Uh, back in the 1980s, uh, the street the, the, the heroin that you would buy on the street in the city was about 4% pure. It's about 35% pure now. And no longer, uh, like it was in the old days, it had to be uh, injected with a needle. Uh, that's not the case anymore. And it can now be snorted or smoked. So that stigma of using a needle that used to be there is no longer there. So. Um, what are we doing about it? Well, we kind of have a two-pronged approach, uh, what we've taken in this county. And there's the education approach and the law enforcement approach. Uh, in the law enforcement area, uh, the laws have been strengthened to go after drug dealers. And we've been given a few tools, including a new state RICO law. It's a racketeering law allowing us to go after not just drug sellers, but the entire organization. Uh, in a recent case that we had, it was our first RICO uh, arrest and, and uh, we're in the middle of the prosecution, but there were 31 defendants involved. Uh, this ring was operating in DuPage and Cook County, trafficking in heroin, and they were bringing in between $2,500 and $3,000 a day in sales. Uh, but this is, that operation took us about six months uh, to investigate and these operations cost a lot of money. Uh, when we start using wiretaps, there's manpower and there's a tremendous expense. The, uh, the state RICO law has a five-year sunset. Uh, we are now supporting uh, a bill in Springfield that will extend that sunset out five years and hopefully uh, uh, permanently uh, to give us this tool. But it's a, it's a great tool for us to go after the organizations. What we're doing with uh, users and addicts is different because the research shows that sending people to jail and prison for drug addiction does no good. Uh, it's about $30,000 a year to incarcerate someone. Drug treatment can cost between three and 5,000 a year and we get better results. So that's what we have been trying to do with people who come in uh, who you know, have possession cases we're trying to steer them into treatment. Uh, and for those who enter our drug court, they actually have the opportunity to have that case reduced and not have it on their record, um, depending on what their record is when they get in and depending on, um, on how well they do in the program. So that's what we're doing at the law enforcement level. Um, the education level, one of the reasons we're here tonight. Uh, we're also working with the Robert Crown Center uh, who have pilot programs in the schools to incorporate education about drugs and heroin uh, into the curriculum uh, because obviously schools are a great place to get uh, information to all of the kids. There's a website that the DuPage County uh, Coalition Against Heroin has formed. It's uh, www.heroindupage.org. Uh, I strongly recommend everyone Go to that website, look at it, and check it out. There's a tremendous uh, amount of resources there. Where to go for treatment uh, for parents, um, you know, for, for drug addicts. Um, a lot of resources on that website, and I encourage, uh, again, everyone to go there. This is a, um, it, it's, it's, it's an epidemic that our community is facing. Uh, and it's going to take all of us to deal with this. Um, before I finish, um, I just wanted to mention one other thing uh, regarding the correlation of prescription pill use and heroin. 
uh, because four out of five heroin users tell, uh, they've stated in surveys that they began uh, by abusing prescription drugs. And, uh, you know, anyone who's gotten a prescription for Vicodin or Percocet or Oxycontin, one of these other painkillers, uh, usually they come in prescriptions of 30 or 60. Most people only use a handful. And what happens with the rest of them? They end up in your medicine cabinet, and that's where kids are getting these pills. Uh, they all state that they get them from their friends, from family members, and they get addicted to the pills, and when they, they can't get any more, that's when they turn to heroin. Um, so that is something that we uh, are working on, uh, but, you know, it's probably not a legislative fix uh, because doctors are going to prescribe them for pain. There are people who truly need them, uh, but it's something that everyone needs to be aware of, that correlation. So, again, um, we're not going to arrest and prosecute our way out of this problem. It's, it's a public health crisis. It's going to require the entire community, uh, but I commend everybody for coming out to learn about this, and this is going to be a, a real um, educational event here tonight. So thank you. Oh, that works. Okay. Thank you. Um, can you hear me? Does that sound okay? I'm going to walk over. Uh, the reason I'm doing this because I have a bunch of slides and I, I, I don't want you to have to look and both. Uh oh. Were we supposed no, to do this? No. Okay. Okay. Uh, can you folks see the slides? Um, this is, I put this slide up here on purpose. This is uh, a really ugly uh, picture. And heroin addiction and heroin is a really ugly disease, and I really wanted it to be a little shocking here. Um, um, but heroin, uh, I, again, I'm, I'm Rich Jorgensen. I'm the current coroner of DuPage County, so we're the office that unfortunately has to deal with uh, people who die of overdoses, and uh, we've had a shocking number of overdoses. I'm honored to see a couple of our deputies uh, came by tonight, Tim Rounce and Aiden Naka, and um, uh, appreciate them being here, but uh, we, they're the deputies who actually have to go out in the field and, and, uh, and take care of people. So I want to tell you a little, I'm going to tell you a little bit about heroin because I'm a, a doctor as well, and then we're going to talk about the statistics in DuPage County uh, related to heroin. But heroin starts at this beautiful little flower, which is a poppy plant, and um, we have this plant in America, but it does not create uh, enough uh, medication to be um, the addictive uh, drug. This little bud in the middle becomes a pod like this, and then this pod is cut uh, with, a, with a knife, and this little sap comes out of it. And it was found out many thousands of years ago that this sap has the highest concentration of morphine of any natural product in the uh, world. Um, this is then is then scraped off. It's a very labor-intensive process. It's done um, in areas like Afghanistan and the Middle East. It needs to have a certain climate. It's typically then brought uh, through uh, into Chicago through Colombia or Mexico. And um, as uh, State's Attorney Berlin pointed out, there's been a very very big change in heroin in the last ten or so years, maybe even longer than that. But the, the heroin from a long time ago was this black tar. And this black tar was uh, a very impure product and very poorly made. And to get an appropriate high, one would have to inject this. And that's where we get the idea in our minds of a heroin addict with a needle in their arm and down and out in a, in a, a street. But you, this is what we have today. We have very, very pure heroin. They are very sophisticated in refining it, and it is white, pure powder. It's very strong, and it's very, very cheap, and it's very available in the Chicagoland area. So 
because it is so pure and so refined like this, it doesn't need to be injected anymore, and uh, it can be snorted or smoked. And so therefore, it's been a whole game changer. It's changed the psychology of the drug and our understanding of the drug. And because people are not injecting it, uh, there's the myth that it isn't as addictive or that it isn't as dangerous or that it isn't as strong. And in reality, um, this drug is just as addictive and just as strong, and you can die of an overdose from snorting heroin just as much as injecting it. So this is the game changer, and this is why it's different now than it was years ago. Um, where did it come from? Well, morphine is a drug that has been around for a long time, and uh, it was found to be very addictive, but it's a very important drug. I'm a surgeon. I used it every day that I was a surgeon. You can't get through major operations. You can't get through some of the life-saving treatments that we have without adequate pain relief. And so morphine is one of those drugs. I used it every day. Um, in uh, the Civil War, we actually came out of the Civil War with a huge number of morphine addicts, and the drug heroin was actually created by Bayer Aspirin and was originally conceived as a, um, a treatment for getting people off of morphine addiction. Um, and this happens over and over in medicine that uh, it had a good purpose, it had a good idea, and it was found very quickly to be more addictive and more dangerous than the drug it was trying to fix. But here's an original bottle of, um, of heroin uh, 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 sold by the uh, Bayer Company. And here's a uh, old, old ad. You can see at the top you can get your aspirin or you can get your heroin to uh, seduce uh, coughs, and it, it was sold over the counter. Um, this is an important slide. This I got this off the internet, so it has to be true. So thank you for laughing. I do that for Nick. So the important thing about this slide is you'll see that on the bottom it's physical harm and on the side it's dependent. So it's, it's describing how addictive a drug is and how harmful it is to your body. And you can see in the middle there's all these drugs like amphetamines and cannabis. And as you work up then way up in the upper corner there's cocaine. And then off the, off the chart in the right upper corner is heroin. It is the most addictive and the most physically harmful of all the illegal drugs that we have in our system. And that's why we're talking about it today. I don't want to talk about all these other drugs because it, it confuses the conversation. We're talking about heroin, which is extremely addictive and extremely dangerous. Um, so what does heroin do? <clears throat> heroin is a sedative type of drug. It causes a euphoria. It attaches to, to receptors in our brain that causes us to feel good and feel warm and feel satisfied. And... Um, and uh, so it is a soporific. It's something where you feel warm and cuddly and sleepy. This is not where the police are going to be finding somebody who's in a big fight or going crazy. Those are the stimulant type of drugs. The, the heroin user or the opiate user is going to be someone who's sleeping in the corner and uh, very, very sedated and very, very happy. And that actually is how people die of heroin overdoses is you become so sedated and sleepy and happy that you don't breathe. And it's actually a respiratory death that causes the overdose. But um, um, how, does, how does it work? It has to get into the body. It's either injected, smoked, somehow it gets into the body. It has to get into the brain. So it crosses the blood-brain barrier. It has to get into the brain to work. And there, actually, it breaks down into morphine. And so this is a really important thing for us to talk about in this conversation that uh, uh, State Attorney Berlin brought up. All of these opiate drugs, Vicodin, OxyContin, this, uh, there's a new drug that's coming out next week that's five times stronger than OxyContin. I don't know why the FDA would approve that, but they did. Anyway, the, these all heroin, morphine, they all go into the brain and they break down into the same basic morphine uh, chemical structure which causes this receptor to turn on. So that's why all of these drugs are so important to think of as a class or as a group because they all go into the brain and turn into the same thing. And then there they attach to these opiate receptors and turn on this warm, uh, addictive feeling. Um, here's just a picture of the morphine molecule on the top and the heroin molecule on the bottom. You can see they're almost identical except for these two arms. And these two arms just basically help it get across the brain barrier very quickly. Those arms are chopped off. 
and uh, in the brain uh, chemically, and then it becomes morphine and it turns on these receptors. Um, so <clears throat> what is the uh, long-term effects uh, of, of heroin? And uh, there are no long-term effects of heroin except addiction, addiction, addiction. There is no casual heroin user. Uh, every heroin addict will tell you, including our resident recovering addict over here, will tell you that within a short period of time, one, two, three, four uses, you are mentally and physically addicted to this drug. There, there, you can argue about these other drugs that somebody might use once a month or once every other week or something like that. But heroin addicts very quickly become addicted. And then once they're addicted, they have to keep using the drug. So addiction, addiction, addiction. What is the lifestyle? The lifestyle is that you have to feed that addiction. So therefore, you are every day living as a heroin addict. So pretty soon, you will be either uh, incarcerated, uh, addicted, or, or overdosed and dead. Luckily, we have uh, good treatment programs, and hopefully we can help people who have addictions recover. Um, so we're, as, as uh, State Attorney Berlin talked about, we had, in 2007, we were going around 25 deaths um, uh, a year in DuPage County, which is way too many just right there. But as you can see, we've gone up and up in 2012. And in 2013, we're up to 46 deaths in DuPage County. That's about one a week. And uh, <clears throat> as we were talking about last night, if you had somebody who was getting shot to death in, in DuPage County once a week, wouldn't there be a hue and cry about everybody going crazy? Well, this is what's going on with this one drug, heroin, in DuPage County. So what... what um, is, what is the demographics? What are we doing? We have, let's say, 38 pure heroin-related deaths in, in 2012. It's mainly males, 30, male, 30 males to eight females. And the age range, you can see, goes from we had one teenager, one 19-year-old in 2020, I mean, 2012, and mainly t 20s and 30s, so mainly the 20-year age range. Now, why is that? As I said, this is not a long lifestyle. You are, you are using a very expensive drug and you have to do it every day. So you're either arrested in jail or unfortunately as an overdose. So this is not, you don't see a, a long lifestyle here, but you do see people that are later on in the age ranges, they're, they're having drug overdoses too. Most of these people are related to opiate addictions where we, we as doctors, uh, often start the opiate addiction, giving opiates to, to people, they become addicted. And then, believe it or not, in the Chicagoland area, it's cheaper to be a heroin addict than it is to be an opiate pill addict. And people then turn to, to heroin. Um, these are the cities where people lived in 2012. And um, you, can, you can see that it's all over the map of DuPage County. I don't put this up here to pimp any, any city or town. We don't have a hot spot in DuPage County. We don't have a poor problem. We don't have a rich problem. We don't have a one corner or another. It's all over the county. It's all socioeconomic groups. And, um, and uh, it, it, you can see it's all over the place. So now 2013 occurred, and we were going along in the beginning of 2013 here with about three or four deaths a month, which is, again, one a week, which is atrocious uh, anyway. But then July happened. In July, starting about July 4th weekend, we started having one death a day. We had 18 total drug overdoses, 11 of which were heroin related. So we had 11 heroin deaths in July. Um, we had already been, all of us have been in, involved in trying to get um, awareness of this, getting into school, starting to talk about this, and that's where all of these programs, what we're doing here today came from. But in July, we had a horrible month. I'm very happy to tell you that since then, we've had quite a decrease in the number of heroin deaths. And November is, or I mean, uh, December is not a mistake. There is no, no one there. We did not have a death in December. So we actually did have a month without a death. So um, in the demographics of 2013, we were up to 46. Again, mostly males. But the 
unbelievable thing that we had happen is we had five teenagers in DuPage County that died. So 19, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, two 20 year olds and two 21 year olds die in DuPage County from heroin overdoses. Um, that is just uh, atrocious, obviously. So that's why we're here tonight and that's why we're talking about this drug, heroin. Uh, and again, we've extended up into the 60s. We had two people in their 60s. These are the towns again. The towns on the right here are, um, are, are towns that had deaths in 2012 but did not have deaths in 2013. Again, this you can see that there was one death in Glendale Heights. And it isn't to, to uh, again, pimp any town. This is all over the counties. It's rich towns, poor towns, rich homes, poor homes. It's whites, blacks, it's Hispanics, it's everyone. So it's not related to one group or one, or one town or one hotspot. Uh, I'm just going to skip through this real quickly here. The, the next thing I just want to talk about, again, is so, so heroin is, a <clears throat> is one drug problem. Almost every heroin addict that we're going to talk to in this county will tell you that they started out their heroin addiction using opiate pain medicines. Maybe in the beginning, prescribed by a doctor in an appropriate fashion, but then became a inappropriate fashion with inappropriate and probably illegal uh, obtaining of, of opiates. And here we see that the drug-induced deaths is the only thing that's going up in, in these fatalities, that motor vehicles, suicides, shotguns, everything's about the same across America except for drug-induced deaths. And here is a thing that we don't really have in this county, but in America, the number of opioid pill uh, overdoses is higher than the total number of cocaine and heroin deaths added together. Now we don't have that in, in DuPage County um, and I think the reason is because we have such a free um, and an available heroin um, um, uh, supply in this area. It's much harder to get the pills than it is to get the heroin. And this is another slide just showing the same thing. So I'm going to just click through these really quickly, but these, these basically are saying that we have had a pain pill epidemic in the whole country, and we do have that here in DuPage County as well. The last thing I just want <clears throat> to point out is that we have a real contradiction in our current medical system versus what, what I'm telling you, and that contradiction is that we are rated as doctors by the insurance companies and by Obamacare by how much pain relief we give. You will actually get, you will actually get surveys, say, how was your pain relief? And you put down there how good it was or how bad it was, and the, the government and the insurance companies very stuff give us ratings, and in the future of Obamacare, doctors are actually gonna be paid by these ratings. Now, if you put down that you got bad pain relief, you're gonna get not paid well, and the hospital's not getting a good, good rating, so we have this absolutely ridiculous um, uh, government evaluation of us based on pain relief. So what's the, what's the doctor going to do? They're going to give the person a, a shot of pain medicine and send them out the door so they get a good rating. There's a, just a complete uh, disconnect here. So we have to be careful about that and we need you as citizens to understand that these are very dangerous drugs. Get them out of your um, cabinets once you're done using them. Throw them away and uh, realize that, that they can be the introduction to a more serious problem. So I thank you very much for your time and we will be available for questions. Thank you. Good evening, everybody, and thanks for coming out tonight. My name is Mark Pickley. I'm the director of the DuPage Metropolitan Enforcement Group. Um, and you ask, might ask, what is a MEG? Uh, if you're not familiar with us, we are a multi-jurisdictional drug task force. We work here in DuPage County with all the other law enforcement entities in the county, and we're made up 
by uh, contributing agencies who provide either manpower staffing or financial contributions to the unit in order to attack the drug problem here in DuPage County. And that's what our, our sole mission is. We're a drug enforcement task force. Uh, there are nine MEGs throughout the state of Illinois. Uh, we started in 1985, and I'm proud to say that DuPage uh, has the largest contributing uh, membership of all the, the other MEGs and task forces throughout the state of Illinois. So that's a testament to the uh, police departments like Glendale Heights um, that believe in, in this mission and drug enforcement here in this county. So heroin, that's why we're here tonight. But how do we get here? So a lot of people think that, um, and Dr. Jorgensen touched on this, uh, starts in the beginning with some other substance. You just don't wake up, and I know you're going to hear this again. You don't wake up and decide, I think I'm going to go shoot heroin today, go score some heroin. It starts somewhere else. So whether it's some of the gateway substances or whether you uh, have a sports injury and are prescribed heavy-duty uh, pain pills and you end up working your way towards uh, a dependency on the pain pills, which eventually uh, runs out, the prescription runs out, then you have a hard time obtaining the pain pills on the street. And when you can't obtain them, obtain them, they're very expensive, as much as $20, $25 a pill. So you turn to heroin. Heroin can be obtained on the west side of Chicago for as little as $10 uh, a bag. Um, so who's, the, hero who's the, the heroin user in DuPage County? Years ago, we probably all had this type of uh, image in our minds. See somebody in a back alley, in the street, Etc. Strung out, um, you know. That's that's the picture I had in my mind years ago when we didn't see very much uh, heroin in the neighborhoods. But the reality of it, this is what you're more more likely to see. You've got the Oscar-winning uh, actor up there in the top right, another actor on the lower left, sports stars, the girl next door. That's the reality of the heroin user in our county today. So it, it, right now heroin is viewed as the number one problem, not only in Cook, uh, DuPage County, I'm sorry, but in Cook County and the Chicago metropolitan area as well. It's a problem in Will County, Lake County, Kane County, the whole region. So Chicago is a, uh, is a big transportation hub for all illicit drugs. Unfortunately, it takes uh, the same kind of paths as all the other transportation methods and modes that we have here that have made Chicago so great, a great location, whether it's rail, the highway system, the airports, et cetera. The drug trafficking organizations have taken advantage of those same established transportation routes. So heroin, uh, this is from 2013 National Drug Assessment. and. Uh, Basically, what it says without reading that whole paragraph is that it's likely to continue. Uh, I know purity level was touched on briefly by uh, Mr. Berlin. And you can see, if you just look at the, the top line there, um, in the 1 to 10 gram range, because that's what the user is getting when they go by their hits of heroin. They're in that range. So you can see that in 07, and these are DEA laboratory statistics. You can see in, in 2007, it was around 24% pure, and the last stat I have available from um, 11 is 43.9, almost 44% purity. That's a huge jump. As that paragraph says uh, down below, that's partly why uh, we're experiencing so many ho overdose, overdoses in general, and overdose deaths is uh, because when you buy these illicit drugs, you have no idea what you're getting. So it could be maybe the dealer you were buying from last week was cutting his heroin, and uh, you were down in the, uh, make up a number, 30% pure range, and the dealer you buy from today doesn't cut his very much. It's more pure. Say it's more than it, 45%. You use the same amount of heroin, you're going to have a, a very bad end result. 
So here's just some uh, stats and what Dumeg has done over the last five years. You can see in purchases, the growth in heroin. Back in 2009, 6% of our cases, and we do roughly about 300 investigations a year, but 6% of our cases in 2009 were heroin related. So, and you can see in 13, it was 26% of our cases. Obviously going the wrong direction. Our purchases and seizures. Uh, what we do, again, we're strictly a narcotics, uh, a drug enforcement unit. And so our, our agents, our officers work undercover and buy uh, drugs from dealers. You can see over the fi same five year period, what we did, uh, heroin rise, was uh, less than, much less, probably only 100 gram r range there in 2009. And in 2013, more than 2,500 grams of uh, heroin. That was a, the difference between 2012 and 13 is 317 or 318 percent rise in a one year period. Arrests, same things. Um, again, we make over 250 arrests per year. Of those arrests, you can see the heroin back in 2009 accounted for 11% of the arrests we made uh, overall throughout the year. In 2013, 21%. Again, the wrong direction. So where does our heroin come from? Um, as uh, Dr. Jorgensen said, it's manufactured mostly in the, uh, in the Middle East and Asian countries. Um, however, South America's gotten, particularly Colombia, has gotten very good at it over the last several years. But once it gets out of those manufacturing countries, how do we get it? Basically from the west side of Chicago. That's the largest area where it comes from. Um, there are dealers to be found out here in the county as well. Fortunately, we don't have any open-air drug markets where you can just drive down the street and score drugs, but it's out here. For the most part, what kids are doing, not just kids, heroin users are doing, are driving on I-290 to the west side of the city, buying their heroin and bringing it back out here. Um, those that are uh, either more uh, inclined to be entrepreneurial or uh, are looking for help with their dependency will buy larger amounts of heroin, bring it back here, and sell it for about double what they buy it for on the west side of the city. So some of the things that uh, if you have any concerns in, in your household, friends, relatives, whatever, some of the things that you should be looking for, changes in physical appearance, hygiene, they're letting themselves go. Um, all of a sudden they're showing up with new people you hadn't seen before, new friends. So uh, you know, I remember this adage from when I was a kid, you're often judged by the company you keep. It's true when you're an adult, you know, just as well. So seeing other things like lying. Uh, if you're a parent and uh, concerned about your kids maybe making these trips to the city or whatever, watch the mileage. Watch your I-pass records. Things start going missing in your home, et cetera, business. So some of the other physical things, Dr. Jorgensen had touched on some of these. Uh, we saw those slides as well. So what is Dumeg doing about the heroin problem in DuPage County? As Mr. Berlin said, we are also doing, approaching this on two different fronts. And, and, and I'm a firm believer that this is a multifaceted approach to this problem. You need education, you need prevention, you need treatment, and you need enforcement as well. You need all those things in order to address this problem. So at Dumeg, we're doing two things. Again, we're a, a law enforcement entity, so the biggest thing that we do is concentrate on making drug arrests. And we don't target the user, per se. Our targets are the dealers. We're going after who's bringing the drugs to the kids and, and people in this county, adults in this county. Another thing we do on a, on a lesser scale, like tonight, is we do these presentations for school groups, for uh, parent-teacher for community groups, et cetera. Get the word out there of, of uh, how evil this drug is uh, and what, what the uh, costs are to society. So here's just some pictures on uh, a jab of heroin. I know you heard this word a little earlier, but that would be a jab. 
So and you get approximately 10 to 14 of those little baggies, and those little bags are about maybe half to an inch by an inch. And uh, on the west side of the city, you can pick those up, pick that up for about $100. And again, if you were so inclined, bring that back out here to DuPage County, you'd at least double your profit. There's a picture uh, from a pretty large case that we did earlier that Mr. Berlin talked about, and uh, that's a portion of some of the heroin that was seized. That's over 600 grams of heroin. Again, some uh, just some packaging, and every dealer, like uh, um, whether it's uh, somebody that's in business legitimately, like a toothpaste company or a cigarette company or anybody else that packages their items, the drug dealers package theirs so that they have their individual logos as well, you know, Pepsi and Coke, et cetera, so that when you see your little red bag with the circles there, you want to find that and you really like that product, you want to try and find that dealer again, or you don't like it, same thing. It's just another one, some uh, the white powdered heroin inside the tinfoil. So again, I uh, appreciate everybody coming out tonight. We're trying to do our part uh, as far as the law enforcement side to help this problem in the county. Um, but like I said, it's a, a, a multifaceted approach and it takes everybody. It takes all of you as citizens, parents, uh, to be aware and appreciate you taking your time to come out tonight. Thank you very much. Person. Can you all hear me? Okay. Okay, my name is Jill Pateros. I'm um, the manager of the emergency department at Glen Oaks, as well as the EMS coordinator, so I work very closely with the fire departments. Um, so I was asked to share in my 15 years of emergency room nursing what I've seen. So, viewer discretion <laughs> right now, it may be a little shocking to you, but everything is correlated to a story that I have from my past as a nurse in the emergency room. So just a little bit of a background about me and what my perspective is so you kind of understand. The majority of my career was at, spent at Loyola off of 290, <laughs> um, the heroin highway as they all call it. So that's where the majority of my experiences with heroin overdoses have come from. Um, a lot of those cases have been kids from DuPage County, Lake County, not from Maywood where Loyola is, all the kids on the way ho you know, home from the west side overdosing, having traumas, rolling their cars. That's where the majority of my experiences come from. I also worked at Illinois Masonic, which was a very different population. Um, north side of the city, big uh, population of homeless people, party kids with DePaul, Wrigleyville, all that. And then also Northwestern. I don't know if you guys remember in 2005, 2006, maybe you guys can correct me. There was a huge problem with fentanyl-laced heroin so I worked downtown during this time. So people were dropping like flies during this, heroin overdoses. It was really bad. They couldn't treat it well enough, and people were really dying very quickly. So all Cook County hospitals, and here I am now in DuPage County, and I must say that I am so impressed working out here with everything that these guys have done, families, everything, because they are so supportive for you guys. In Cook County, it is what it is. Out here, you guys are really, really supported by your law enforcement, you know, your community. So please don't take advantage of that. Use, you know, use that for your own good and for your families because it's really, really impressive coming from another county, okay? Everybody else did statistics. A lot of this is going to mirror what the other guys have talked about, so we can just kind of fly through it. Um, here's just a little bit of some statistics. This is through 2011. The, the yellow part on top are all other drugs and then the blue is heroin. So you can see it's pretty close to a 50% for emergency department visits. Okay, very, very common. <coughs> These statistics are from 2013, and this is from Glen Oaks. Okay, so I just did a rough estimate this weekend about the number of EMS calls that we got to our hospital where Narcan was used. Okay, so 
June and July, there was a really big spike there. Um, you, could see, you could have seen in the, one of the other PowerPoints as well. And I can tell you right now that three of these people from EMS did pass away, okay? I didn't put that into another slide, but we did have a couple deaths last year. So it was over the summer months. So it kind of correlates with the other PowerPoints as well. This was also discussed, you know, what the faces of heroin pass looked like. Everyone thought of what a junkie looked like. It was very thin, strung out, on the corner of a street, um, dirty, all these kind of things. Who it is now are your popular kids, okay? Kids that are wanting to go to college, that get mixed up maybe with the wrong crowd, try it once and are hooked to it. Family friends of mine, you know, their children have been hooked on heroin. My cousin as well. They were kids that were, had huge, huge hopes for the future. Athletes, all this kind of stuff. One day they tried it. Again, they didn't wake up saying that they wanted to become a heroin addict, but maybe they blew out their knee in football, started on Vicodin, and slowly everything progressed. They were just normal kids, just like we all are, you know, growing up, doing the great things. And one day it, just, it happens and a, a switch just literally flips, all right? So it could be anybody in this room. So please, it's really important to me for you guys to realize that it could be the kid next door, because it may just be. So looking for those signs and symptoms of you know, acting different or having different friends, these are really important things to watch for in your families. They talked about gateway drugs to heroin use, um, Vicodin, Norco, kind of similar drugs. You have your uh, oral Dilaudid, Percocet, and Oxycontin is uh, another really big one. My cousin, I can tell you now, like people were saying, you know, Vicodin, you're prescribed maybe 30 to get you through a surgery. My cousin was taking up to 45 pills a day, okay? Um, at one point, my aunt found him on the floor, overdosed again, and literally she stood there contemplating like, should I even do anything this time? Because he just never learned. And thankfully she did, and he you know, went to the hospital, and that was the last time he overdosed because he got help and he turned his life around. But how horrible as a mother to literally sit there and look over her son and say, I can't do this anymore, and his body can't do it either. So that was the last time he overdosed, and he's doing great, and is married and has a kid, but you know, sometimes people aren't so lucky. So please recognize, if these medications are sitting around your house, get rid of them if you're not using them because it can happen very, very easily. All right, so that's just the increase. We discussed that already. So I think now becomes like kind of the gore, more gory pictures after what is heroin because we discussed all this. Um, it is from the poppy plant. It can be cut with different things, sugar, cornstarch, um, even ground up drywall. When I worked at Loyola, that was a common thing. Um, in Maywood, they would just literally crush up drywall and put it in the heroin. So you just don't know what you're getting, okay? So very, very dangerous. Obviously, it's more pure now, and that's why there's more overdoses, but you just have no idea what you are putting in your body when you, it comes to heroin, all right? 10 times more toxic than morphine. Again, that was already discussed. Purity. Very, very pure right now. Back in the day, you're going to see battery acid in it, rat poison, having it cut with fentanyl. Um, when I was at Loyola in Northwestern, this was huge. Fentanyl's really, really strong. It's an opiate, and it just kind of changes how heroin is in the body. It's very, very strong. It attacks those receptors really quickly. Again, if you don't recognize what bag you had last week or yesterday, you had the red bag and today you have the green bag, you don't know what's in it, and it's very, very dangerous, okay? If you're playing with fire with this stuff. Methods of use, this was discussed. So kids, you know, especially the kids, I, I grew up up north in Lake Forest in Libertyville. Um, a lot of people focus on their looks there, so they're, they may not use, you know, injectables. They may be snorting it. They may be smoking it. So these are just different ways that kids, you know, are moving into this addiction further and further until they do move into it, um, injecting it, because they need that, that really strong high, okay? So those are just some things. As far as track, mark go, track marks go, um, I had a, a kid, he was a 17-year-old from Northbrook, and this was probably 2008 or something like that. Um, the parents, he went into rehab, he, he did really well, he was okay, you know, for six months. He came back, um, went to the west side of Chicago, 
was driving back on 290, rolled his car with his girlfriend, and so we called the parents to come, because obviously he's a minor, and the parents said, but there was no new track marks on him. We checked, we checked his arms every day to make sure there was nothing new. I'm telling you now, don't let that fool you either, okay? People will find a way. They will inject into their tongue, into their toes. You know, it, kids are smart. <laughs> Give them the credit that they deserve because they are very good at hiding things. And, you know, the lying and all that kind of just goes along with it. All right. What does heroin do? We saw these on the other slides. It slows everything down. You know, movement puts you in this dreamy, euphoric state. Um, pupils are constricted. That's another really you know, prominent side, side for um, heroin use. So looking at your kid's eyes, are they any different than they were b a week before? Taking a good look at them is really important, okay? Okay, now here comes the gory picture. So if you're like, have a weak stomach, maybe you don't wanna <laughs> look at them. Um, here's track marks, you can see. Those are fairly newer, I would say. Here's some um, older track marks, as well as skin popping. And this I saw more in the city than I've seen out here. Um, if they don't have veins anymore and they still want to inject it, they'll inject under their skin, so then it'll absorb. That was a really big one that I saw at Illinois Masonic when I worked there. Okay, that's a bad picture. But this is something that I've seen. So there was a girl that used to come into Illinois Masonic all the time, and she was from DuPage County. Um, and she had such a bad infection from heroin injections, she would literally just inject. It, the, the, that kind of scab was up on her forearm she would literally just inject right into the vessels in her arm that she could see. So she would come in probably a couple times a month with just massive raging infections in her arm, and she just didn't care. She, it's not that it, she didn't even care, she just couldn't stop. It, was so, it took over her whole life that she ended up having to have that arm amputated because the infection was so bad, and she didn't care. I mean, it just took over her whole mindset, okay? And then overdose is obviously one of the big ones. Crocodile, I, I kind of went back and forth about putting this in there. Um, it has moved to Illinois. It's called the zombie drug. I don't know if any of you have even heard of this. It's a synthetic heroin. Um, it's normally codeine. You, is it codeine, I believe, that's cut? Do you guys know much about it? Have you seen it? No? OK. Um, codeine cut with something. So Loyola has seen two. Um, they have a burn unit, so they've seen two patients, and then it was also, I believe, in Joliet. This is, this is very gross, so <laughs> again, if you have a weak stomach, please. It started out um, in Eastern Europe, and it's moved here to the U.S. It's here. It's not good. It starts eroding the skin because of what everything is cut with. All right, the third picture th that's going to go up right now is really bad, so please turn your head if you can't do st stomach stuff like that. So this is what it can do to your skin. So my best friend still works at Loyola, and this is what she saw on a patient, that it just literally ate away at her skin and the tendons and everything else just because of what it's cut with. Um, people are making it. It's cheap. It's easy. So this is something to keep an eye out. Again, I haven't heard anything around here, but it is in Illinois. Okay. Overdosing on heroin. Um, Narcan's the big drug. Um, officers are starting to carry it, and I agree with that. I think it's a really important thing, especially in DuPage County with this problem. Um, at the top right picture, that's um, something you can put onto the syringe that you can inject it into the nose to help people wake up. Down at the bottom, there's the injectable. That's what we would probably use in the hospital if you can get a vein. Um, people that overdose on heroin can wake up in a lot of different ways. This is not the face that you want to see when you're waking up from heroin because I'm so passionate about it and it's so frustrating to me, but I love you like my own family member, so I will talk to you. You know, there was a kid at Loyola that got thrown out of the car by his friends in front of the ambulance bay, and we had to run out to get him. But as they were throwing him out, they took off because they saw us coming out as nurses. They ran over his leg, and he was blue, okay? We had to drag him in. We gave him Narcan, he woke up and he was fighting. I got clocked in the face, <laughs> another person got spit on, um, because it's literally reversing that I could only imagine is like punching someone in the stomach and being in massive, massive pain because you're throwing somebody into withdrawal right away. They're scared, they don't know where they are, they don't know where their friends went, and so these people are terrified. 
And so all I can say is, you just died and we brought you back. And that's always my line to people. And a lot of these young kids don't believe it, but it's true. These kids are blue, they're not breathing. They don't have a heart rate until we give this medication and we can turn it around. So time is of the essence and it's really, really scary when you're fumbling around and you can't find a vein and you can't get these kids back right away, whether it's fentanyl laced or laced with something else, it's a very scary thing. So I take it very personally just because of my family history as well as like with friends. Um, these guys sitting over on this side work with me. They know how I am. I'm tough love, I'm a stubborn Polak. So any, you know, anybody that wakes up from an overdose, I wanna spend the time with, try and talk to them get them into programs. So that's what we do in the ER, okay? There's some more pictures, but I think you guys have seen enough, so <laughs> I'll just leave it there. All right, thank you. Is this on? I guess. Yes. Um, well, while he's getting that up, I will introduce myself. My name is Angelica Salvaggio, and I am so thankful to be here tonight. And I'm, I'm very sad that there's not, to be honest, more people filling these seats. I have a very invested interest in Glendale Heights. I love this town. I love the people here. Um, I teach fourth grade at Americana, and I taught at Pheasant Ridge. I taught second grade there for a couple years. I taught third grade there for a couple years. And now I'm at, like I said, Americana. And I just love the families here. I love the kids here. And I see what they're up against. And so when I see this end of um, society and where they're headed and where they are now, it, can't, it, does, it makes me want to fight for their future. And so when I see this, it makes me sad because what's coming at them is heroin. And I want them to meet heroin in these seats with their parents and get the tools to fight against that awful drug. Because that drug is real and is something that we could sit here and break down the educational aspects and that is very important and it's a cr cri critical component but it's something that does impact families and real people. And so that's why I'm standing here. Heroin has impacted my life in many ways. And I could go on through lots of different awful stories, but I'm just going to give you a little snapshot of how it's impacted my story. And before I even get into that, I always start off saying, um, let's stop and think about what a story has. Because as a teacher, I like just to stop and take a big picture about where we're headed. And a story has characters, or setting, there's a plot, there's a beginning, a middle, and an end. And as the story unfolds, certain things can happen to change where your story is going. Every single person in this room has a story. They have people in their life that have their own story, and it's greatly impacted maybe what has gone down in their life. Um, a little bit more about who I am. I grew up in a great family with lots of loving people surrounding me. I had wonderful parents. I had three brothers. I went to a great school, had a fantastic education, and um, that just continued into a great education in high school. But in high school, I had a love for fun. And as any high schooler, I sought out fun in any way that I could find it. And that kind of led me to hanging out with maybe not the best crowd. And my mom always told me, Angelica, you're a white glove. And when you go into dirt, what's going to happen to the glove? It's going to get dirty. And so my mom was a very, very invasive parent. So for those of you who maybe are parents here or grandparents here or a sibling or whatever, be invasive people into other people's life. My mom would stay up every night and wait for me at the door and smell my breath and ask me a hundred questions. And in high school, when I talked to kids, I'm like, those people were my villains in my story. They were someone who I did not care for. I thought they were gonna ruin my life. They were killing my fun. But now standing here today, I am so 
thankful for those invasive people in my life. I had invasive teachers that supported me, that carried me through those hard times in life. And so I was equipped to fight against a lot of the struggles that high schoolers face. And I can't say that for all of my friends. And as a high schooler, I watched all my friends over 10 years ago walk into this addiction of heroin. And it's something that has ravished their life and it has changed their story. And, and, and that broke my heart. I felt bad for my friends. I felt bad for them thinking like, that, that is how their story ended. And it impacted who I was as an adult. But heroin doesn't just shy away because unfortunately it's a taboo word and people don't want to bring it up. They don't want to act like it's in their neighborhoods or in their families or in their towns, but it is. It does not discriminate. It does not pick the rich or the poor, or the, the smart or the uneducated or the employed or unemployed or the whatever. Anybody is susceptible to becoming a heroin addict and there, there is uh, a trend that can be prevented. And this is one of the ways to preventing it tonight is to sit here and to talk about it and to hear how it comes, how it enters, how it progresses so we could hopefully stop that from going on. Um, earlier we heard about some numbers and, and some numbers of overdoses that have happened throughout DuPage County. And, um, and those are real numbers and I think they're so important to talk about, but I think it's also so important to remember that that's not just a number, that that is a person with a story behind it. And so when we hear about like, you know, this many deaths in DuPage County, that's that many people whose story ended. It's that many families that are standing there now left with the, the broken pieces of losing a piece of their heart. It's that many communities that are now lacking and missing that one person that could have had a story that impacted it for the good. And, and what I, um, and unfortunately, that's something that happened to my family. And that's what um, we are here now standing here tonight sharing t with you our story and how we have imp been impacted. Um, we started an organization called LTM Heroin Awareness and Support Foundation. And our mission um, is to um, educate the public or whoever we could stand in front of. I mean, our passion is to get in front of parents and, and especially students so that they get introduced to heroin through education so that it could be prevented, so that no other family or community member has to suffer from another loss to this drug. Um, and, and then we're there to support those families who have been affected by this, because it is real. And the statistically in this room, the chances of someone in here being affected by this drug are, is very, very likely. So how did this all start? It started with a boy named Louis, Louis Theodore Maselli. Um, he, um, he grew up with a very similar um, story as me. I normally don't cry. He was a very loving boy who lived life with passion. He had a great mom and dad. He had a brother who loved him. He was like my little brother who I, we loved. We had a very special relationship. And um, he had a great education, went to Driscoll, had everything that the world had to offer. He was a boy who had all the friends, he had all the girls, he had the athletic ability, he had the charm. I mean, he had the most people at Salerno Funeral Home, number one attended wake. I mean, he was a rock star. And, and, and Louis liked to have fun, and he liked to hang out with people and, and be the life of a party and have a good time. And so often in high school, what comes along with that is marijuana and, and alcohol. And, and we're not here tonight to talk about those two things, but, but I cannot not touch on that, that, that there is a progression and a stepping stone to how this drug enters a world of a high schooler. Because when... High schoolers are feeling down, when they're feeling sad, this not only just becomes something that they do to party, but then they use marijuana or alcohol as a coping mechanism to get through those hard times. And that door then is open. And marijuana today is very different than it was 10 years ago, 20 years ago. 
but it is also very different than heroin. Heroin will kill you. There's no question, there's no doubt on that. Marijuana obviously will not bring you to the coroner's office, but it is something that many people have started with. It's something that my cousin started with, and that progression just continued throughout his his adolescent years. And he left, he graduated from Driscoll High School, had three championships, state football rings, was a very um, excited boy to get into his future. He had dreams of owning his dad's deli and doing things with his life. He, didn't ha he did not have dreams to becoming a heroin addict. That was not his hope when he was a little boy or when he was in high school, but that's what he eventually became. This is what he was like. He had a passion for his brother, Vinny. He loved to fish. He loved to explore. He loved bugs. He loved the little things in life. He was an average boy that had a great future ahead of him. This is the new face of what a user looks like. That's not what I view. When I, would have, when I thought of what a heroin addict was when I was younger, it was, a, it was those pictures that you want to turn your head away from. But these are the families that they come from. These are the people that they're surrounded by, good families that have built their family on love and morals and things and serving others and paying it forward and loving each other. I mean, this is the reality of a heroin addict today. It's not what we view and the stigma that's attached to it. And, and so until we stop thinking about the stigma and look at that as being the new addict, it opens up our eyes to the things that we are really up against and the battles that we really have to fight against. It is against our youth and people who have hopes and dreams and futures. My cousin had a very typical story to this addiction. He was prescribed a pretty little bottle with his name on it. And it was prescribed to him with good intention. But that bottle, once that was out, it needed to be refilled. Not because of the doctor's orders, but because of what was going on now inside of my cousin's mind and in his body. It not only fixed his physical pain, but it somehow made him feel better emotionally. And that led him to other places. And a lot of times when you don't have that refill, you go to the medicine cabinets in your house and in your friend's house and in your grandma's house and in your neighbor's house and in your whoever's house you can get into. And that progression leads you to having to go to the street to buy them. And then that progression leads you to hang out with friends and people that you don't want to really surround yourself with. Because what happens to that white glove? It becomes dirty. And it, and it becomes what it's surrounded by. And when you're surrounding yourself by people who are using pills to, to, have, um, to support their addiction, they, they, they go and resort to things that are more accessible. And in our county, heroin is very accessible, and it starts off very cheap. Pills cost a lot of money. Heroin, $10, I could handle that. And that was what my cousin did. He walked down that path not knowing what he was walking into. And there he was a heroin addict. It destroyed him. It destroyed our family. It ravished it. It wrecked it. It changed it completely. And on August 7th, 2012, it ended my cousin's story. My cousin was fighting hard for his life. He went away to rehab. He came out. He thought he was, he was good. He was ready to fight the fight. He was ready to live life like a normal boy. And four weeks after that, Heroin took his life. And this is the reality that we ha now have to live with as a family. And we need to fight for that voice that, his, that is no longer able to be spoken. I mentioned earlier that my cousin had a brother, Vinny. He still has a brother. He is up in the corner on that one and then down over here. And he is also a heroin addict two brothers living a life as a heroin addict. He found his brother, and what did he run to? Heroin. That is how powerful this drug is. But my cousin Vinny, I am so thankful to be able to say this today, that he is sober today. He went away for help, and he is fighting, fighting. I'm not even kidding, like fighting against this drug today. This is not something that's an easy battle for him. Some people have, have an easy walk, but, but he is now not only carrying the burden of his, his fight, but his brother's. 
And this is something that he lives with on a daily basis. They did not think that their story and our family story was going to involve heroin, but this is the reality of what heroin does. It comes unwelcome and unwanted, and it is in our neighborhood. And you're going to hear from Nick because we both ran into the same kid downstairs. I was walking in. I was looking for, for Tanya, and I saw a, little, a, a young boy sitting there, and he's like, hey, what's up? I'm like, hey, you know, he asked me how old I was. I was like, what kind of, what kind of question is that? But whatever. So he, we started talking, and he was there to pick up his friend. And I was like, oh, yeah, okay. He's like, yeah, he had retail theft. And I'm like thinking, and my head instantly goes to heroin, understanding the whole progression and the world behind it. And so we get to talking, and, and I told him, you know, what, what I'm doing here. He asked me if I worked here. I'm like, no, I'm going to this heroin awareness forum. I'm like, you should come. And he's like, I'm a recovering heroin addict. And I was like, like, you know, thrown, like thrown back completely. And thank God he is a year and a half sober. And I like, I celebrate that like crazy because when someone gets to say that date, that is huge. And tonight we get to celebrate <laughs> another one, which is awesome. But he was picking up his friend who's still using. So two little boys that I just ran into walking into this thing, which they should be sitting here, two of them have been hit by it. And they are from this town. So it is here. I see it. I had a father pass away last year from that addiction, a student. This is something that's real, and it's something that is not going anywhere. And so we need to, as a community, stand up and fight and not be afraid of the stigma that is attached to heroin. And we need to educate our kids, and we need to educate our parents, and we need to find not only the tools that we, that we need, but how to apply them into our life so that this does not happen to another family. It, it's it, it's got to stop because this is not going to be a pretty ending to anyone's story. And so this is what we're doing. We're standing up to heroin. We're fighting. We're, we're not being afraid of what it has done to us, but we are trying to use it for prevention and for the good of those around us. Um, we have a website, so if you want, you could check us out, ltm or ltmfoundation.org, um, and you could see where there's other, where, where else we're speaking. We speak um, pretty consistently as a panel, and so if you um, want to encourage maybe another friend or a family member to come, check out LTM, and DuPage County um, Heroin website is a fantastic resource. Um, so definitely spread that around. Um, and right now, I want to introduce to you um, someone who has been a role model to me, an inspiration to me, um, someone who has taught me how to fight and not give up, someone who has taught me how to be a mother that um, does everything for her babies. Um, I have a little baby girl. She's in second grade. So she has taught me so much about things in life. And um, I am honored to introduce to you my aunt, my Auntie Felicia, and that is Louie and Vinny's mom. Hi, everyone. Um, first, I would like to thank Glendale Heights for having this. And you said you had one death a year. Um, it doesn't sound like a lot until it's someone you love. Um, and um, I just want to thank you for hosting this. And um, I also want to thank these people that I've been spending so much time with. Um, you guys are warriors in uh, taking on this cause. And, and I know you have home life. You must have a, a life besides this. But um, I just am so, so thankful to be associated with all of you. <laughs> you guys are awesome. Um, so like Angelica said, you know, I have two beautiful boys, happy to be a mom. It was really, really just what I wanted to do in life was to be a good mom. And um, had these beautiful boys and raised them to be involved. And uh, was, you know, we were in every sport, C Cub Scouts, uh, worried about their grades, you know, put them in a private school, made sure they had every opportunity available that I, I my husband and I could provide. And um, Wanted him to have every advantage in life, and we were we were doing that. And um, they played high school in football, and pretty soon sports injuries happened. And
and were prescribed um, pain opiates and you know, pain pills and um, you know they did start drinking and um, doing pat in high school and you know I I wasn't so concerned because you know the other friends were doing it it didn't seem like it was out of balance but you know um, looking back I wish I would have been a little more aggressive at that point and um, addressed it and um, took it on at that at that point. Um, but I just thought it was normal. Boys will be boys, and um, they went. Um, Louis went to college to Benedictine, and he didn't fare well there. Um, he couldn't play co um, college football. He was too little, and um, was missing his sport. And um, came home and wanted to work at the family business. And um, you know, was in the city, and he was driving on the heroin highway every day. It was introduced to him, and. Um, found out my son was doing heroin and I remember even hearing the word for the first time like your son's doing heroin a friend told me I was like heroin there's no way my kid my not heroin I, d I didn't know anything about it um you know I, th I, ag I thought it was the drug of, of the old like we saw um just couldn't believe that it had entered my 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 kid's life um you know, sometimes I still can't believe how, how it's just ravaged our community, that, that it is a common word that we all have to speak. You know, <laughs> it's, it's just changed so much from when I was young. Um, and I, I can't believe it's part of my daily life now. Um, and if it was um, any other disease that children suffered from, people would be fighting to get in here to learn how to prevent it so their family's not a... a, a afflicted by this what could we but but it is a drug that people are embarrassed and ashamed and um, don't want to be associated with but we can no longer no longer pretend that it's not here and and you know destroying our families and our lives we can no longer sweep it under the carpet it's you know it's it's just not possible we'll be losing too many people so we need to keep this conversation alive. And when you leave here, um, talk to about at least five people. Make a commitment to talk to five people about what you learned today and spread the word, especially if they have, you know, um, preteen and teenagers. Parents need to know about it and that it's on, it's on their horizon for their kids and they will probably encounter it somewhere. Um, also, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of veer off. Um, you know, we're speaking about doctors prescribing prescription drugs, and um, there's there's some bad doctors out there. And if you see that a doctor is prescribing um, 50 Vicodin for uh, a sprained ankle, stay away from that doctor, um, and t and tell your friends to stay away from that doctor. Um, that's a that's a bad doctor, and he's only going to per perpetuate this this epidemic. And um, you know, it, it happens, and, and it happens out here. I, I, I heard of someone today, that's why I brought it up, that, you know, the, the, the addict's drug um, doctor shop, and um, they, they tell each other, you know, this doctor is an, easy, is an easy mark, and he'll give you whatever you need. And um, so, you know, I, I, I don't want to <laughs> be liable for anyone, you know, I don't want to be sued, but... <laughs> You know, I, I think, you know, as a community, I don't know what we could do about that, you know, publish. I don't, I don't know how we can do that, but we can do it for each other without, you know, putting it out publicly. If you see a doctor over-prescribing, tell your friends, that's a bad doctor. Um, and, and that will probably save some lives in itself. Um, we are a community, and we do need to take care of each other. Um, you know, I think, like, if... Um, there wasn't some some other thing that was taking down our people. I would want somebody to say, you know, Felicia, you need to you need to watch out for this. Um, so that's why, you know, I'm doing this because you know to see my beautiful son's picture all the time, um, and 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 just think that he's not here is it, really hard. But I would want someone to do that for me. Um, so uh, you know. Um, so you can do this for me by passing on the w on the word. <laughs> um, you know, when I thought about LTM, you know, after my son passed and what could I do about it, you know, 
it was just an idea and my friends and family really ar about around me and um you know we supported each other and and we are making a difference so there is if there's anything in your life you know that you you think that you can't um talk about you can and um you know take on a cause and maybe take on ours and like ltm um <sighs> You know, my son Vince is, is, is fighting this disease and, uh, you know, it, it's a tough road and you don't ever want to see, you know, anyone suffer like this and uh, it's a daily battle and, and uh, you, you are reminded that, you know, um, you have to take care of yourself and, and your disease comes first. Um, and it is a disease, you know, and we cannot treat it treat addicts like they're a second class citizens it is a disease if you know you want to treat a diabetic like it's um like they're you know lower than the norm um and and that's another reason why i want to talk about this because you know sometimes you know i grew up in you know i lived in medina for 30 years and a lot of people are shunning me and um you know i have two addicts so i i i, I want to be bold I, want, I i don't you know i think if i if i close my door in embarrassment, it would just perpetuate and this disease would grow. Um, and uh, I just wanna say that just too many families have been torn apart by this. They're, they're bankrupt, they're exhausted, they're shadow, shattered. And not a minute or day goes by that I don't miss my beautiful son. And um, I just want you to know he did not die in vain because of this and he will not be forgotten. Thank you. Good evening. Hello. Good evening. Can everyone hear me? First of all, I want to start tonight by um, we do this quite a bit. Um, we're, we've been granted a great opportunity to, to bring this all over a bunch of communities and we need to hear it again for Felicia Angelica. We've done this, um, like Auntie Debbie says, we're going to be on heroin five times this week bringing this into different communities. So these ladies, you know, get up here and spill their guts every night and tell them, you know, what their tragedy was. So I think a big round of applause goes out to them. <laughs> and to these three guys over here, you know, thank you for doing everything that you do. It's, it's an honor to stand up here with you guys and thank you for missing your home life as well. So thank you. Um, can you hear? Can you hear me now? <laughs> Perfect. My name is. No, I'm just kidding. My name is Nick. Um, I'm from Bartlett. I'm 29, and I'm a recovered heroin addict. Um, the first time I've said a recovered heroin addict, and I feel, I guess, kind of, I bet bold in saying that because there's a when you say that, that's a bold statement. You know, I'm, I'm going to be a heroin addict for life, so don't let me fool you with that. There's a difference between recovered and cured. I'm never going to be cured of my disease, 100%. I'm going to carry this with me the rest of my life. But I've been you know, brought back from a hopeless state of mind and body that I get a daily, rep daily reprieve that I'm recovered today. And this is a day-by-day -day basis. Um, you know, thank you truly all for coming out here tonight, too. This is something that um, you know, people are getting shot every eight days. People would be fighting police officers. How are you going to solve this issue? So um, kids are falling down every eight days, so this is how we are going to fight our issue or this issue. Um, I was raised in Bartlett. I have a younger brother who is four years younger than me. He's a United States Recon Marine somewhere in the world right now. And um, I share that because, first of all, he's my hero. And secondly, I was, I was born in a normal middle class, you know, just childhood, uh, middle class family. I had a great childhood. Everything was, you know, given to me that I worked for. Um, nothing was handed to me, but I was offered, you know, anything at my disposal as long as I worked hard enough for it. Um, hockey was at the core of that. I played hockey since I was four years old, four or five years, I'm sorry, four or five years old, and um, was, you know, fortunate enough to um, move to Cleveland, Ohio, and play a couple years of junior hockey. Um, but in that, in that meanwhile, when I start, you know, when you're playing hockey at a rougher, at an older age, it gets a little bit rougher, a little bit tougher, broken bones start happening. At 17, I broke my collarbone twice um, within a five-month span and was introduced to her uh, heroin, um, not yet, um, was introduced to opiate narcotics at that time. Um, and by the grace of God, I didn't become a drug addict at that time. Um, 
my first drug was smoking pot and drinking alcohol. That's where my that's where my drug career started. I don't necessarily know if that's a gateway. That's just where mine started. So you can make you can connect the dots however you'd like. Um, but when I was 20 years old, um, I had a, a great hockey career or a hockey thing going. I had a loving, supporting family. I had a girlfriend that waited for me at home. I had the world at my fingertips and uh, was diagnosed with a 19 millimeter kidney stone and put in the hospital and a stent put in and multiple surgeries throughout a year. Um, and when, you, when that's going on, doctors are prescribing me excessive amounts of opiate narcotics, specifically Norco and Oxycontin. Um, but what I noticed when I first started taking these um, at this time, that it was you know, doing something more than I could have ever done for myself. Not only was it removing that physical pain, that little weirdness, that little hole, that little I don't ever feel okay in life um, was taken away. I mean, I always got along with everybody. I had diff different group of groups of friends, but I still never felt like I really fit in. And when I found out that opiate narcotics, you know, took away that void, <coughs> it was game over. Um, that was when I was 20 years old. Um, I entered my first rehab or detox maybe at 23, um, right after I had a fiance walk out on me. Um, because of my addiction. I lost a job because of it. Um, my car was being repossessed. And this is before heroin even entered my life. Pills had taken me over. Um, you know, it made mention earlier that, you know, you take 40, 40 painkillers a day. Um, I would wake up with 10 to 12, you know, Norcos, the 10 milligram Norcos just for breakfast. That's what it took to get my day started. So I wasn't sick. You know, most people are having toast and hash browns. I'm eating, you know, handfuls of, you know, yellow, yellow pills that were my, my, my solution. Um, I don't really know where this, where in my story I crossed over from being, you know, a recreational drug user to a full-blown drug addict, but I can tell you that happened really quickly. Um, I, I, in my pill addiction, um, leading up to heroin, I've been to, uh, I don't even know how many detoxes, one specific rehab. I've been to numerous jails, numerous court dates. Um, you name it, I've been there and have multiple t-shirts to prove that it sucked. Um, really sucked. So I went to, uh, I was in Wisconsin. I thought a geographical change was going to be my solution for this issue. Um, but come to find out that um, it's not people, places, or thing that's the issue. It's me that I'm the problem. I have this, you know, I self and me is my issue. Um, so when I figured out that um, I, my thought process was I'm going to go north by my grandma's house and uh, I'm going to re I'm going to run from my addiction. It, there's no drugs up there. I'm fine. Well, within three days of being up there, I'm in Clark County Jail on a $2,500 bond for home invasion, or, or residential burglary, excuse me, which was, um, by the grace of God, brought down to possession, which I don't even know how that happened. Um, but God, that's where God, this is where God kind of started planting seeds in my life. Um, I, went to, I went to rehab. I did 11, or th maybe like eight or nine months of just really nothing. I you know, went through the motions and... Um, you know, didn't really do anything to change. I went back to living at my mom's house where it was comfortable. Um, you know, I, I made her cross that line between helping and enabling along that point, too. She didn't have a really choice in it. Um, it's something that she was forced into. Um, <clears throat> and this is where, you know, I feel like my story really, <laughs> really starts to begin. I thought it was a beautiful Tuesday afternoon. Life is great. I won concert tickets from downtown. I went and picked them up with my rehab girlfriend. Don't get one of those. Nobody. Um, <laughs> But we were driving down there, and um, we're driving back, and she's like, oh, you know, I used to buy heroin around here. Well, where at? We'll get off at Cicero, or I think it was Costner, or whatever the first exit is going back um, by Cicero. So we get off there. We, you know, get on Cicero. We hook a left on North Avenue. And not even, you know, eight minutes of being off the expressway, not only did I buy my first bag of heroin, I was doing my first bag of heroin. And that's where the game changed. You know, everyone's talked about the game changer. You know, these kids play Call of Duty these days, and they can't beat that game. They put in a little code. The game changes. They can beat that game. It's easier. Um, that's where our, my game changed, too. I, I can never go back. I'm pickled, like they say. You know, there's a process where a cucumber becomes a pickle. You put in some vinegar, and all of a sudden you're a pickle. You can never go back. Well, that's how my life is now. I'm 100% pickled as a heroin addict. That's something that will be with me until the day that I die. And I hope to God it's a sober death that I have. But I'm going to stand in front of you tonight and tell you that you know, tomorrow I do celebrate two years, which is by the grace of God. But you know what? That's yeah, I, I need to, I, I guess, you know, back up and, and focus on, you know, the things that I did in my heroin addiction. Um, I went to Cook County Jail as a young white kid from the suburbs. Um, I would drive around the west side like I own that place. I would be down there three, four, five times a day. 
You know, Mark quickly talked about that. That's the truth. You know, but I didn't want to go down there. I've, if I could have done it once a day, I would have been totally happy. But once your addiction starts growing, you can't, whatever you pick up, you're doing. You try to, you know, budget your dope, but you can't budget your dope. But I also had to commit crimes in the process. I had to go empty my mom's security de deposit box out of the bank, everything in there. I had to go and steal five grand from an employer so I could continue my addiction. I stole a gun from a family member because I got robbed on the west side. I had drug dealers that I was paying hundreds of dollars each day telling me to go to rehab. I'm buying one or two jabs a day to split with me and my friend, you know, my friends. And that's where life took me. I thought that was normal. I thought I was a cool kid. I was just as much addicted to the lifestyle and the chaos that I was the drug. Um, and it should be known, too, that I never once shot heroin. I was a heroin addict for 11 months. I never once had to shoot heroin. I had friends shooting heroin all around me. I had friends dropping like fries, flies, overdosing. I've lost, in the two years, I've lost, I believe, 11 friends. My most recent one this past November. Like, this is no joke. It's killing people. You know, I'm a face with this story here, but this is way bigger than me. I, I should not be standing here tonight, especially two years into this. You know, I had, to go to a re I had to go to rehab again. I left after 12 days because I got honest for the first time in my life. I couldn't feel anything as a heroin addict. It steals your soul. It numbs you. It makes you a disgusting, manipulative, lying, cheating, thieving mf -er that I never even knew was possible that sat inside me. This thing was just brewing. You put more heroin in, it's just brewing. Um, so I had to uh, get honest in rehab for the second time in the same rehab, hearing the same exact things and wondering, how the heck is this going to work this time? I'm sitting in there with the same counselor. I'm one room down from where I was last time, wondering how is this going to change? So I got honest. Um, and my honesty took me to walking out of rehab um, after 12 days and um, pulling a stunt that I never even considered. That was my, that was my, that's my latest bottom, but I should back up. Two weeks before that, I decided to go into rehab on, um, when I realized that heroin became my Valentine's Day date and I didn't have any money to take a girl out, that, you know, that heroin was legit, the girl that I was going to be with that night. That was my date. Um, that was the bottom. I went to rehab the next day on the 15th. Um, after being honest and telling my mom, you know, those things that I just shared um, in person, in a row, um, not spread out over like a 25 or 30 year span, you know, that I had, I got honest. So I, um, you know, I still have the, the heroin is still running vibrant in me. Now I've been 12 days removed from heroin, but it's just, it's just brewing in me. It's telling me to run. It's telling me to go get high. It's telling me that it's not going to be that bad this time, that you could control it better this time. This is what heroin does. It mean, manipulates you to think that what you're about to do is the perfect solution and the right idea. So I leave rehab in a cab after taking the garbage out and go to my house and I'm going to kill myself. I left a suicide note at rehab. I left one at my house after I broke in there. And once I realized that the keys, the money, and the gun is gone, what am I going to do now? This is my latest bottom. So after realizing that I just broke out of rehab, that nobody's really going to trust me because I've lost all of that along the way, that um, I need to hurt myself. So I take a butcher knife because I need to feel something. And I slice through my Achilles tendon like it's, you know, hot butter or hot knife going through butter because I need to feel something. So I had to call an ambulance on my own feeble suicide attempt. We can laugh about it now. But here I am, you know, I am I am broken out of rehab. I'm laying in the back. I, the cops come in because there's a weapon involved with guns pointed. This is now the third time I've had guns pointed at me, really close. And, you know, at that point, it was either I need to try something different or I know exactly what I'm going to get. And I remember laying in the back of the ambulance and having that aha moment that they talked about. Just looking up and saying, I'm not going to do it my way anymore. I'm going to give it another shot. And to be quite honest, I haven't looked back since through the grace of God, and that's the only way that I'm standing here tonight. I went to a, tree, I went to a rehab, or I'm sorry, I went to, after you pull a stunt like that, they send you in the psych ward for five to seven days, which is totally bogus in my eyes. I'm kidding, by the way. I totally need to be there. But I, um, I, I went and moved out. I lived in a sober living home for three months. I lived with another guy in the program. I got an apartment with um, people that are in recovery, that work a 12-step program, that are doing the right thing. See, I need to relearn how to do life. I only know how to do life one way, and that's as a thief. Heroin has completely manipulated me that it's literally crawling before I could walk. So all these things have built up, and I've been, you know, fortunate enough to, you know, work with LTM and these fine gentlemen in multiple police departments that um, this is what I do to stay sober today. I have to talk about heroin every single day because it's in my life every single day whether I want it to be or not. Like, I don't have a choice. So if me coming out and sharing my story could help, you know, save someone, you know, from traveling down this path, then it's a win. Um, I shared this last night, and I think it's a really good analogy, is that 
Um, have you ever met a half pregnant woman? Like, I mean, legit, have you ever met with someone? It's either all or nothing, right? And that's how heroin is. It's either all or nothing. You don't get, a, you don't get to take a day off from committing a crime because, well, you're going to be sick and you're going to hate your life. A heroin detox, a heroin dope stick is the worst thing you'll ever encounter in your life. The absolute worst thing you will ever encounter. Your, uh, your, thousand, your flu times a thousand, you're part, you're part of the way there. Um, you know, we've been in, you know, 21, 22 schools. We probably talked to close to 20,000 kids. And this is our mission is to continue to go out there and educate the kids. You know, make them aware of what's going on, but really get to the root of the problem. Tell these kids that no is a complete answer. Like, they don't need to give their friends any other answer than that. You know, and share them that, you know, we're not condoning smoking pot or drinking by any means. That's how my story started, so I don't think that's a good idea. What we're trying to convene to everyone is that heroin is a beast of a different animal. Kids are literally dropping dead after one use. I have friends that have been clean for, you know, my latest friend was clean for four years. Within one day of doing it, he is dead, rolling through Rich's office. You know, that's, it's, it's the, no joke. It's here to stay. You know, we're going to dent it, and we're going to do everything absolutely possible. So when Felicia says, you know, go tell five friends, go tell ten. Clear out your medicine cabinets. That's where it started. My grandparents, you know, it caught on real quick, real quick, and I made them look like real idiots because I tried to play it off. I pitted my own grandparents against other parts of the family. That's what my disease does. It's waiting for me out there. You know, it's great, you know, in a couple hours I'll have two years, but I could leave here tonight as a heroin addict. Again, I'm going to be that for life. And go right down 290. You know, I know that area really well. Comar is one of my favorite places in the world. Well, it used to be, I should say. So, you know, thank you for being here tonight. I, I didn't think that this would ever be possible to come and do something like this. So, um, crazy how two years. My mom is here, too. I think my mom needs to. Never once walked away. So, I'm going to share this night with my mom is awesome. So, um, question and answers now? Questions? Yeah. Oh, yeah, Felicia has something to read. And please listen to what Felicia has to say because it's super powerful. And it gives you a really good glimpse of what, you know, what a heroin addict goes through on a daily basis. So thank you. Um, before Felicia reads that, I just want to let you know how, um, how sad it is in this county that I, I said that I had two deputies here, and they're not here anymore because they came over and talked to me that they're going to the south side of the county that we have another heroin death <laughs> just right now. So while we're here today, we have one more heroin death. But I do want to I do want to take this time to say congratulations on your two years. Yeah. <laughs> This is a poem about heroin. Hello, my name is Heroin. I destroy homes, tear families apart, take your children, and that's just the start. I'm more costly than diamonds, more costly than gold. The sorrow I bring is a sight to behold. And if you need me, remember I'm easily found. I live all around you, in schools and in town. I live with the rich, I live with the poor. I live down the street and maybe next door. My power is awesome, try me, you'll see. But if you do, you may never break free. Just try me once and I'll own your soul. When I possess you, you'll steal and you'll lie. You'll do what you have to just to get high. The crimes you'll commit for my narcotic, narcotic charms will be worth the pleasures you feel in your arms. You'll lie to your mother. You'll steal from your dad. When you see their tears, you should feel sad. But you'll forget your morals and how you were raised. I'll be your conscience. I'll teach you my ways. I take kids from parents and parents from kids. I turn people from God and separate friends. I take everything from you, your looks and your pride. I'll be with you always, right by your side. You'll give up everything, your family, your home, your friends, your money, and then you'll be alone. I'll take and I'll take till you have nothing more to give. When I'm finished with you, you'll be lucky to live. If you try me, be warned, this is no game. If given the chance, I'll drive you insane. I'll ravish your body, I'll control your mind. I'll own you completely, your soul will be mine. The nightmares I give you while lying in bed, the voices you hear from inside your head, the sweats, the shakes, the visions you see, I want you to know these are all gifts from me. But then it's too late, and you know in your heart that you are mine and we shall not part. You'll regret that you tried me, they always do. But you came to me, not I to you. You knew this was happened many times you were told, but you challenged my power and chose to be bold. You could have said no and just walked away. If you could live that day over, now what would you say? 
I will be your master. You will be my slave. I'll even go with you when you go to your grave. Now that you've met me, what will you do? Will you try me or not? It's all up to you. I can bring you more misery than words can tell. Come take my hand. Let me lead you to hell. It's author unknown. Thank you, Felicia. Thank you for, for all of you for sharing your stories with us tonight. It certainly puts a face on the statistics um, that we hear about and we see. And, and I think Felicia said it very well. And, and um, when she said that, you know, I had mentioned to her earlier today that, you know, we've only had about one a year um, as we go. And, and she's put it very well that it's, yes, it's one a year. And I look at it that way very coldly sometimes. Um, but when you have a, a face and a name and a family and friends, it certainly makes a big difference. Okay, well, I would uh, like very much to thank our uh, distinguished panel for being here tonight. If we could give them one more round of applause. <laughs> I would also like to thank, again, uh, Community Outreach Specialist, Tanya Mako. And our uh, DARE instructor, uh, Scott Grolke, for uh, assisting in getting the program put together tonight. And I would like to thank, again, all of you for coming here tonight, supporting the, the fact that uh, you realize that it's something that needs to be addressed. Uh, we need to find out about it. We need to learn about it. And we need to prevent it. And then after that, if we can't prevent it, we need to get into the treatment portion. But tonight was about prevention. So thank you again.